And welcome to Hannity. Tonight, emotions remain high in New York City following yesterday's announcement that NYPD officer Daniel Pantaleo has been cleared in the death of Eric Gardner. Now, last night, we witnessed hundreds of people taking to the streets of New York City and other cities around the country to protest that decision. According to the New York Post, at least 78 arrests were made throughout the night, and more demonstrations are expected tonight. We turn now to Fox's own Jonathan Honey standing by in the middle of tonight's crowds with the very latest. Jonathan. Sean, the crowds are even larger than they were, in fact, last night. We are in downtown Manhattan. We're uh, behind me. You can see the Supreme Court of New York and the federal courthouse. So we are at the heart of the New York justice system, the justice that these people feel was denied to both Eric Garner and Michael Brown. Let's try to talk to a couple of the uh, protesters here and see how they're, why they're here, uh, what they're what their point is. Tell me, sir, why, why, why are you here tonight? Uh, well, I am um, a pastor in Brooklyn, and as a religious person, I believe that my faith um, and all faiths uphold the sacredness of life. And Do you feel the justice system was served in these cases or not? No, I feel we live in a state of an injustice system. I think the justice system seldom serves poor people and people of color in New York and uh, everywhere in the United States. Ma'am, could I ask you your thoughts on why you're here this evening? It's for the same reasons. I don't think that there's justice for poor people or color, people of color in this country. Now, the, the point has been made, for instance, in the Michael Brown case, that many of the eyewitnesses uh, who gave testimony to the grand jury were African American, and they said that they believe, from their point of view, uh, that Michael Brown had actually turned and charged towards uh, the officer. Uh, and they heard all the testimony. Same with the grand jury in the Eric Garner case. So a jury of your peers said that justice is being done by not charging anybody. What do you say to that? Well, I, I don't necessarily agree, but I won't put myself in their place. But the point is, there's a whole systemic culture where, you know, with you had white cops constantly controlling and having power over the poor people, people of color in the community, and people aren't represented within the community. And as long as that's the case, then it's very difficult to take uh, with seriously uh, some okay. testimony. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Sean, those are the views down here. You, seem the, you hear the same chants once again, no justice, no peace, hands up, don't shoot. Sean, back to you. And Jonathan, thank you. Meanwhile, earlier this week, the Congressional Black Caucus caught a lot of heat after taking to the House floor on Monday night to address the grand jury decision in Ferguson, with several members repeatedly referencing, hands up, don't shoot. Watch this. Hands up. Don't shoot. Hands up. Don't shoot. Hands up. Don't shoot. To all Americans who are disturbed by the demonstrations that are taking place across this nation, I want you to remember these four words. No justice, no peace. These demonstrations uh, show that this issue of detention and stopping of black men, especially black men in the streets, has been simmering below the surface. Joining me now, CBC member, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes uh, Norton. Uh, you say the issue of, you know, detention and stopping black men in the street. You are, did you read the, the evidence that was released in this case? I do not, and that is not a concern. That's the, the, the evidence uh, the, isn't a the, concern. For me, for me, for me, what? out of for me, out of this tragedy, now Eric Garner has come a much larger concern and a much larger picture. You but these are and words that, that you're saying. You have, the, that has to. You have a position of power. You're saying that the evidence in the case, that the reason, yeah, the get, reason get that Michael something. Brown was stopped was because the police officer had a report of a robbery and Michael Brown fit the description of the, and he turned out to be the guy, of the guy in the robbery. That was in the evidence that you say you won't take the time to read. Why? Uh, I'm sorry. If you want to talk about something that other people said, you can. This is my view. Witnesses? My view is that wherever you stand on whether it's racism, whether, whether who struck John, we are losing the big picture. And the big picture, and the reason I think young people are in the streets, is because of the stops. Uh, the stops on the street for people who happen to be black so often that it has become routine. This is an opportunity 
for a conversation between police departments and their own communities. And that is what I am hoping come out of this. Not well, well, more who struck John in, in the evidence. It's interesting. That's it's for you. Fascinating. That's for the pundits. That's not where I am. And if you invite me, me to talk about where other people stand, then you're not going to get that. It's where fascinating I stand to is me, we ought to be discussing. We ought to be using this as an opportunity to discuss how police and African Americans in our communities across the United States can begin a conversation that we've been needing to have for decades But your decades colleagues, now. Congresswoman, woman, have well, gone out there, excuse me, I, do not speak I am to talking about what happened on the House floor. They went out there with a narrative that is proven false. If you took the I time, look, can I finish my any, question? I went out there as well, and I spoke for with myself. With hands up, If you want to ask me what I said. Are you going to listen to my question, or are you going to speak over no, me? I, I have I'm a question for you. I'm going to tell you what I said, and I'm willing to talk about what okay. I said. If you want to talk about what they said, you have them on your program. All right, let me explain to you what the grand jury heard, because that's called evidence in a case. Let me put up on the screen what, uh, what juror number, witness number 10 said. The police officer exited the vehicle with his weapon drawn, pursuing Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown was quite a distance, and he stopped, and when he stopped, he didn't get down on the ground or anything. He turned around and did some type of movement. I've never seen him put his hands up or anything. I can't recall the moment that he did. I'm not sure if he pulled his pants up or whatever he did, but I saw some type of movement. Then he started charging towards the police officer. Officer. The police officer then returned fire, well, not returned fire, open fire on Mr. Brown. Another person, another witness said that Michael Brown charged Officer Wilson like a football player with his head down, which would render the narrative, hands up, don't shoot, a lie. Why would, why would people in Congress, lawmakers, advance what is clearly, based on the evidence, a lie? You know, is your problem that you couldn't get any of them to come on to explain themselves? Because I didn't do any of that, and I didn't say any of that. But you sat the there. Did that you that say anything against the it? The fact you is that there was the conflicting case. testimony. The there was conflicting testimony. Some people are going off of the testimony you said. Some people are going over the other testimony. That's not my concern. My concern no? is to start a the conversation your concern? with police departments. Evidence if you want to talk concern? to people who have other concerns, have them on your show. Evidence isn't a concern. If, you, if you're going to take a position on a case? In other words, if Michael Brown didn't rob the I store, lawyer, intimidate the clerk, the if he didn't fight for the gun and charge the officer. I have read the transcript because my interest is not in what, ha in what happened. My interest is in what should happen, where what we go happen. forward from here. That is my interest. Thank you very much. I have one last question. Is there a lesson to be learned that people shouldn't rob stores, intimidate clerks, fight for cops' guns, and charge at them like football players with their heads down? Is that a lesson to learn? That lesson gets taught every day, and I certainly hope everybody learns that there's a larger lesson here. Well, it's larger and that than lesson that? Is, that lesson is between law enforcement and the communities they police. Let's get together. Let's figure out what we can do about this big issue in our country. All right, Congresswoman, I, I hope you'll take the time to read evidence in the case before you talk about a case. I think it would be helpful. I, I haven't talked about the case. I've talked about what we should have, do going forward, not about the case. Well, you talked That's about the quote, issue of the deliberate stopping of black men. You did That's talk about, about that as a result of the That's case. That's not about so the case. So maybe you should read That's the facts of black this case. Men in the United States of America every day. Considering That's not that about precipitated the case, your remarks, you that may want to read the evidence. The case. So Tell don't it. put what you want to put on me on me because I'll come right back at you. You can come right Right back at me all I you want. want. Say. Maybe you should read laws before you pass them, and maybe, maybe you should maybe read you about the case as evidence before, before you come on. You them. ask me questions. I know, but you talk about a case. You didn't read the evidence. I didn't talk about the case. I talked about the detention. Talked about the issue of, of detention and stopping of black men. men. That's what precipitated and this that discussion. That's a great lesson of what has happened in New York and what happened in Missouri. Uh, well, that's exactly my point. The evidence is important. You should read it. Thank you, Congresswoman. Appreciate your time. And meanwhile, my next guest, uh, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, is speaking out about the Eric Garner case and says that he thinks politicians and taxes are to blame for the entire situation. The senator joins us. Uh, senator, good to see you again. I, uh, I'm making the same point. Six dollars a pack, city, state taxes, that has created a black market. And they literally have cops, because of the revenue involved, with fines and arrests, they have cops whose full-time job is to go into stores and check that the New York tax stamp is on every pack of cigarettes. This is insanity to me. Never should have yeah. happened. This man never should have been involved with the cops ever over this issue. 
Well, and it may not be the whole explanation, but it's at least part of it. Because the thing is, is about six months ago, a directive came down from City Hall through the police commissioner saying that we want you to aggressively go after people selling individual cigarettes that may or may not be taxed. And I think, my goodness, do we not have enough violence going on in our community that really needs to be policed, that we're going to go harass people Senator, for selling even worse, cigarettes? You, you could smoke a joint in the streets of New York City, and all you're going to get is a, a summons. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not even kidding. That is, that is no. how this, go, this mayor treats that issue. But I don't want to make light of this. I've seen the video, unfortunately, several times, and it is sad. It's horrific to see him gasping for breath and saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And there was a case like this about 30 years ago. There was the Michael Stewart case where in New York City he was spraying graffiti in the subway walls, and it's illegal, and we don't want it to happen. But he was held in a chokehold by 11 white police officers, again, who were indicted but that were not convicted. The question here is something wrong really also with our tactics. You know, I understand police have a tough job, and if someone's armed and you're unsure and it's dark and all this, but this was in the daylight. They outnumbered him five to one. I think there was a better way than holding him in a chokehold. Like I, I know that I am sure, and I really want the evidence released because first, we have to go back. Nine of the 31 arrests of Eric Garner dealt with untaxed cigarettes. I mean, it's absurd. The whole the, the notion that this is even a factor in this man's life is unbelievable to me. Um, but if I think for people that really want to understand the grand jury decision, I bet it was very sanitized, very technical. What are the officers taught in terms of appropriate behavior, inappropriate, uh, inappropriate behavior, a legal chokehold, a chokehold versus a headlock? A carotid artery chokehold, an air choke. I bet it got very technical in there, and a headlock is not a chokehold as everyone defines it. And I would well, argue that that's probably how they came to their decision. Here, here's the other thing, Sean, that not many people have been mentioning. Legal standards are difficult standards sometimes to prosecute people, but there's another standard for employment, and I think one announcement that would be good, and it's sad in this officer's case, but at the same time, he used bad discretion. He didn't use discretion, and he made a very unwise decision. He should not be given the power to have that, to be able to use that kind of force. So I don't think you can have an officer that makes this bad of a decision work as a policeman. And yeah. I know that sounds sad, but I mean, Eric Garner died, and he didn't need to die. But do you really believe that the officer's intent was any? I mean, there was a resisting on Eric Garner's part. Yeah, no, I don't I think mean, it has so, to be the intent. Uh, what, do you, do you, I don't think it has to be the intent. And that's why when you talk about conviction or indictment versus continued employment, there's a much different standard. The well, standard for being a police officer is a lot then? different. How is he supposed to get him to to agree to be handcuffed if he's not going to agree? Right. Well, I think that uh, using deadly force for people who aren't armed really but, is not what we should but use. I, but again, if you look at the coroner's report, yeah, it contributed, but he also had high blood pressure. He had asthma. He had heart disease. All contributing factors to his situation, no? Right. But it, you have to have discretion. So, for example, if you see an 85-year-old woman jaywalking, it's against the law. Do you put her in a chokehold? No. Hole? You see no. a guy, this is a big guy, but you see him selling cigarettes. But if he resists, what do you the community, do? Is that the something the community really All wants right. to even be involved with, is what I would say. All right. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. And coming up, Thanks, the one and only Ann Coulter is here in studio. But first, coming up tonight. These are folks who want to always blame law and order, the police. They're always on the side of the lawless. It's a bigger battle than just what happened in Ferguson. It's an effort to delegitimize the American system of justice. So are those on the left, are they trying to delegitimize the justice system in the country? That's coming up next. Later, our Hannity producers, along with David Webb, they traveled back to Ferguson, Missouri, to see how those small business owners are faring after their businesses were looted and after they were burned and all the destruction after last week's riot. That's video you'll only see here tonight on Hannity. How do they rebuild their lives? Which leads us to tonight's question of the day. Has the media been paying enough attention to the lives and businesses destroyed by the riots in Ferguson? Just go to Facebook.com slash Hannity or Twitter at Sean Hannity. Tell us your answer. I'll give you mine at the end of the show. Straight ahead.